Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Novel Solutions for Unbiased Results in Metagenomic Analysis of Human Microbiome Samples, presented by Matt Fosbrink, Scientist, BRC Product Development, Kyogen, and Dominic O'Neill, Director, Microbiome Product Development, Kyogen. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts and sponsored by Kyogen. For more information about our sponsor, please visit www.kyogen.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speakers will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Matt Fosbrink and Dominic O'Neill. I will now turn the presentation over to them. Hello, everyone. My name is Dominic O'Neill. I'm very pleased to give the presentation today on Kyogen Solutions for Unbiased Results in Metagenomic Analysis of Human Microbiome Samples. Before we start, um, just a quick disclaimer that the products that we're talking about in this presentation are all intended for molecular biology applications, and they're not intended for the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of disease. So our agenda for today um, is to, to talk about the microbiome and sample preparation with a particular focus on 16S sequencing. So um, I will uh, start talking about microbiome sample preparation, a little bit about microbiome itself, um, and then talk about our current best solution for stool DNA isolation um, so that you can get good results for downstream sequencing. Um, at that point, at the agenda point three, Matt Fosbrink will take over and he'll talk about 16S sequencing and Kyogen solutions to solve the and specific challenges around NGS sequencing of the 16S gene. Um, and he'll end up with a discussion of um, a cool saliva microbiome study that we did in-house. All right, so starting off with microbiome sample preparation, um, it makes sense to start with a definition of our terms. And so what does the microbiome mean? Um, we're all familiar with the term by now, I believe. Um, but just to, to clarify, microbiome is the, defined as the collective genomes of the microbes that are in or on the human body. Um, and so there can be different microbiomes. There can be a stool microbiome. There can be a skin microbiome. Um, and the, the, that microbiome is the genomes of all those organisms that live on that site. The microbiota refers to the organisms themselves that inhibit, inhabit that environment. And then metagenomics is what we do when we're trying to study those collective geno genomes. Um, and so the microbiome has become a, a hugely interesting field of study, um, and the Human Microbiome Project was one of the first to really catalog um, which organisms live on the human body, um, and uh, the results of those studies suggest that we have many, many thousands of organisms that live with us, um, and that essentially all of those organisms together provide um, a second genome. The, the genes present in the microbiota um, outnumber our own genes by at least 150 to 1, um, and the byproducts of those genes have pretty serious implications in things like our, our metabolism, our health, um, creation of disease, and so on. Um, and so by looking at which microbiota are present in different sites, we're able to determine that different body sites have unique communities um, and that race, age, gender, weight, ethnicity, diet, um, various other things all have an effect on the composition of your microbiome, and then in turn, the composition of your microbiome has an effect on um, human metabolism and health. And so it's um, an incredibly interesting method of um, understanding a uh, level of information about human biology that hasn't been really looked at um, 
before the last couple of years, and it all starts with looking at the microbiome sample. Um, and if you're going to be doing a microbiome study, you're really looking at one of three analytes, either DNA, RNA, or protein. Um, and depending on what you're looking at, you're really answering some slightly different questions. So if you look down at the bottom, um, there's two major questions that we're trying to answer when we do microbiome studies. And the first is which organisms are present and what are their relative abundances? And we can do that really by doing DNA sequencing. So you can either do it by doing a whole genome shotgun sequencing and figuring out all of the organisms that are there. Um, if we're also looking at things like fungus, yeast, viruses, that's actually the only way to get most of those. Um, but one that is um, a very attractive method is 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. Um, that gives you bacterial and archaeal um, sequences, and by sequencing a relatively small portion of the genome, but one that has the power to um, distinguish different bacterial species from one another, you can get a very broad overview across many samples um, without using uh, too much expensive sequencing, and that'll tell you which organisms are present in the um, sample that you're looking at. And then you can take that data and pick it apart and look at, see which um, organisms may be beneficial and which are harmful. Um, when you look at RNA and you look at proteins, you're looking more at what are the functions of the community there, which genes are being expressed, which proteins are present. Um, and that's a little bit outside the scope of this presentation. Right now, we're focusing on the left side of that branch of that tree, um, which is looking at DNA extraction and 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. It's still the most um, cost-effective way of doing microbiome sample analysis. And so Kyogen has put a lot of effort into putting together a workflow for um, going from sample to insight on, on the microbiome. Um, and so the Kyogen sample to insight workflow starts with sample disruption, um, looking at the, the new kit that we're going to be talking about today is the Kyogen Power Fecal Pro DNA kit. Um, this is a second generation version of the Power Fecal um, kit that was originally developed by MoBio um, and now further developed by Kyogen. Um, and that focuses on two major problems of microbiome sample analysis, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides, which is the sample disruption and sample preparation. And we, so we solved those two issues. Um, and then the library preparation is the next key point that needs to be taken care of, um, and that's handled by the CAI-Seq 16S and ITS panels that Matt will discuss later on. Um, in this case, we've been doing our sequencing on Illumina platforms, and then we can do our data analysis with the CLC Bio Microbial Genomics Pro Suite, um, which gives a very easy, high-performance way of analyzing um, taxonomies and biological functions, um, which is pretty easy even for non-bioinformaticians to use. Um, so the reason why sample preparation is such a critical point for microbiome studies um, is that the, the sample, when you start at the beginning, the sample prep um, will affect everything that you do downstream. So if you don't have an effective sample prep, you're not going to get a good 16S sequencing calls um, and or uh, quality of data, and you'll be missing some of the critical data that's um, present in your sample. And so the the factors that can affect um, the final data quality um, are things like not homogenizing your sample sufficiently, um, not lysing your cells um, sufficiently, and that's particularly a problem for microbiome samples where you can have some very difficult to lyse samples. You could have spores, you can have um, the various gram-positive bacteria that um, will not break open through the sort of standardized uh, chemical lysis methods, and so if you don't correctly choose your method to, um, to do your lysis, then you're going to influence, you're going to bias your downstream analysis towards easily disrupted bacteria. Um, and then, of course, the common uh, DNA isolation issue is that if you don't um, have a pure sample at the end, then you're going to have problems with your various downstreams. The, the nucleic acid quality itself will affect how well you're able to an analyze it. Um, but because one of the most important microbiome um, samples are gut samples, stool samples. We also have the problem that there are a lot of substances coming from the sample that are not DNA, um, but which will potentially cause problems for your, for your prep. So you can have nucleases and proteases that are still present. You can also have um, 
analytes that are going to interact with the various cellular components and prevent you from purifying your DNA. Um, you can precipitate your DNA because you didn't get rid of some of the proteins that are present um, or bioactive uh, compounds that are present in your sample. Um, and then you have a particular problem also of um, small molecule inhibitors, of which um, stool has quite a lot. And those, if not removed efficiently, will purify with your DNA and then prevent your PCR from um, giving you a good unbiased view into the data. So you can, you can classify samples a bit across these two um, uh, factors and how difficult they are to lyse and the level of inhibitors that are present. And there are samples like blood or animal tissue or cells which are both low in inhibitor content and are difficult to lyse, or sorry, that are easy to lyse. Um, and most of the existing DNA purification methods will work fine on samples like that. Um, and then you have samples that are relatively easy to lyse but have particular challenges like FFPE where you probably have to use a specialized kit. Um, and then you also have some things which are, are um, low in inhibitor content but difficult to lyse potentially, like some difficult bacterial cultures. Um, those, again, may require somewhat of a specialized um, method but are relatively easily solved. And then you have the difficult set of samples. You have things like um, plant tissue, stool and gut microbes, soil samples, um, biofilms, and those are all in um, quite difficult to lyse um, without bias and they're also very high in inhibitor content, which can cause problems for your downstream. And so Kyogen has invested a lot of effort into solving the problems of the sample types that fall into that upper right quadrant, the high inhibitor difficult lysis samples, um, and that's really what we are focusing on with the newly developed um, kits around um, the the line of kits that we call the power kits, so the power soil, the power fecal, um, those are all designed at um, very efficient lysis of microbial samples in difficult matrices. So we do a mechanical homogenization with tailored lysis buffers, um, and we can do DNA, RNA, DNA and RNA and protein um, in various different uh, um, formats. Um, but the combination of mechanical lysis so that you have an unbiased bacterial presentation along with the use of um, the patent inhibitor removal technology, or IRT, which is present in any of the um, Kyogen kits with power in its name, um, enables us to get very clean samples out of these difficult um, materials. And then we have them available in various formats um, since a, a microbiome study may involve um, a handful of samples um, that are being tested and can be used over normal silica spin filters to people who are using um, hundreds or even thousands of samples and require high throughput automated applications. Um, and the technology is adaptable for all of those solutions. Um, so I mentioned a couple slides ago that the sample derived PCR and RT-PCR inhibitors um, are a problem, and they're a particular problem in stool. Things like bile, bilirubin, and heme um, cause significant problems um, coming from stool samples. Um, in soil, there are things like hemic and fulvic acids. In plants, it's mostly polysaccharides and polyphenolics. Um, but when we break open cells to get the nucleic acids out, um, all of these inhibitors are also released into solution. Um, and the reason that they are inhibitors is that they often act quite a lot like DNA. Either they bind to DNA or they bind in similar ways to DNA. So if you don't do something particular with the sample, um, you're going to, to end up purifying these inhibitors along with your DNA. Um, and so you have to set uh, or find a method that is specialized at removing these inhibitors from these difficult samples. Um, and there's a lot of different inhibitors, and they can work in different ways. So you can have inhibitors that work by um, getting rid of components that are necessary for your downstream reactions. You know, for example, the um, magnesium chelation, um, the PCR won't work well if the magnesium um, isn't uh, titrated properly. And if you have something that comes from the sample that is pulling down the magnesium, your PCR will not work as well. Same thing with reaction cofactors. 
Um, but then, of course, you also have direct interaction with your nucleic acids, either things that will bind to your enzyme and displace your nucleic acid, things that will bind to your DNA and prevent the enzyme from um, binding to it, um, or things that may bind directly to the, to the enzyme and inactivate it for some reason. And unfortunately, stool is one of the samples that has a lot of these um, inhibitors. So if you use a, a standard um, nucleic acid prep, you will almost certainly have very bad downstream effects. Um, and here you can see an example on this slide of uh, what the inhibitor te removal technology does. On the right-hand side, we see two Eppendorf tubes. Um, on the left, the clear one is when we put our IRT technology in. You can see it came out clear. And the second one was a stool sample where we did not use our IRT and used um, a standardized DNA purification technology. And you can see even there our LUIT is brown. All of these um, inhibitors carried through. Um, and as you can imagine, your downstream PCRs are not going to work well in a sample that looks like that. Um, and our IRT is very carefully calibrated to get rid of these samples without harming their DNA. I'm um, sorry, not get rid of the samples, to get rid of the inhibiting um, substances in your samples without harming the DNA. Um, and it's incredibly effective. And so we've used that. Um, it's, been a, it's well established already. The power soil and power fecal kits um, are, are well known. They're a standardized part of things like the Human Microbiome Project. Um, and what we have done is um, created a second generation of the power soil and power fecal kits. Um, and so the Kaya Amp Power Fecal Pro DNA kit is currently the gold standard for removing inhibitors from stool while getting unbiased uh, microbial lysis. Um, so we've updated the microbial lysis bead tube from the first generation. The new tube um, will work significantly better. Um, and also it will be much more efficient for things like spores and fungus samples compared to the legacy kit. Um, the inhibitor removal technology um, is equally effective. That was a gold standard before and it continues to be. Um, we remove basically all of the inhibitors um, that we are aware of that can cause problems in our downstream, either PCR, qPCR, um, 16S gene sequencing, or metagenomic shotgun sequencing. Um, and so we know that the purity of our samples is very, very high. And so the second generation of the kit, the Power Fecal Pro, has also been streamlined from the first version. Um, we have about 18 minutes of total protocol time um, to get from, from your sample to the high purity eluate. Um, and here's an example of what we mean by the improved yields. Um, so this is the, the Power Fecal Pro DNA kit used on three different um, stool samples. Um, and compared to a couple of commercially available kits, and you can see that it vastly outperforms um, the competitor kits, um, getting up to 20-fold higher DNA yields. Um, and that's due to really the, the optimized um, bead tube that we've newly developed, as well as the optimized lysis buffer. So everything is solubilized in that first step. Um, and once it's all very thoroughly solubilized into solution, we can do the bead beading um, and crack open all of the bacteria that are present um, and then move on. And the yields themselves probably don't say too much on themselves, but the next slides will show that the purity is also um, very high. So the, the trick is, of course, getting both high yield and high purity at the same time. And so here you can see that we get excellent yields from the Kaya Amp Power Fecal Pro Kit. Um, here again on a gel, just to verify again the improvement in yields. Um, on the left-hand gel, you see um, the improvement in yield from fungus from the Legacy Power Fecal Kit to the um, Power Fecal Pro Kit. That's the lanes um, one versus two. And then in the um, gel B, that is the performance of the power fecal kit in B, the legacy kit. And C um, is the power fecal pro. And you can see um, vastly improved DNA yields, um, particularly for both donor one and donor two, where the new kit does a much better job of breaking open some of the difficult samples.
And as we mentioned that the, um, the IRT provides also a significantly better purity. Um, these, are, these box plots give you the averages of the 260-230 and 260-280 ratios of the stool samples prepped across these different kits. Um, and on the far right, number three, is the new Chi Amp Power Fecal Pro Kit. Um, you can see that our 260-280 is right around 280 with very small divergence from that ideal point. And our 260-230 um, has a little bit more variation, but it's spread around too. So we have a nice, good, pure DNA coming out of our prep um, and considerably better than what we're seeing with competitive kits. Um, and of course, that really matters once we translate it over into sequencing. Um, and then we, what we do see is that with our new kit, we do see an improvement in the alpha diversity that we get out of a sample. So if we take our samples, run them through this newly developed Cayenne Power Fecal Pro kit, we'll get a better bacterial lysis um, as shown by the higher yields. And then that translates into detecting additional um, species when you do the 16S sequencing. Um, and so we're convinced that this is a new gold standard for microbiome analysis from stool. Um, and to talk about the downstream portions of it, I will now hand it over to Matthew Fosbrink, who will talk about the 16S sequencing. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Fosbrink. Um, thank you, Dominic, for introducing the, um, the Power Fecal Pro Kit. Um, so next, I'll be talking about the, our um, new uh, Chi-Seq 16S RTS panels um, for gene sequencing or next generation sequencing. So basically, um, this 16S sequencing answers the question of who is there in a complex microbial sample. Um, uh, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene has been classically used for uh, taxonomic classification of both bacteria and archaea. Um, the reason being is that all bacteria and archaea um, contain this conserved gene. And also, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene has been extensively sequenced. So there are multiple sequences for um, almost every species um, that has, has been um, isolated. So these sequences have been, um, uh, uh, have been compiled into different databases which allow for classification. So the databases um, most widely used are uh, Ribosomal Database Project, or RDP, uh, Green Genes, and SILVA. So the result of, of uh, sequencing from the 16S um, uh, from 16S sequencing is a taxa or or the equivalent to species characterization in a sample. So when you get the um, the taxa in a sample, you can do relative distribution of a taxa in a sample from um, very low resolution. Uh, to a high resolution in a taxonomic tree. So uh, here is the depiction of the taxonomic tree um, from kingdom to species. So you can go from a very low resolution or broad uh, picture at the phylum level, um, also depicted here, where there is um, a broad classification or broad uh, characterization of a sample where you can see four phylums in this particular sample. Or you can um, look at a more higher resolution at either the genus or species level. So in this, on the right-hand side um, is more higher, higher pre precision or taxonomic resolution um, in the same sample looking at a number of genuses. Um, this same approach can be done um, to classify or to, to identify fungal in a, in a sample using uh, fungal ITS or other phylogenetic marker genes. So the reason 
um, the human microbiome is important is, is because, as Dominic mentioned, that it's been shown that a, a human microbiome has um, lots of associations um, with health and disease. So there's been a core microbiome that has been identified that where it's defined by where um, uh, a core OTUs is shared by more than 95% of individuals. Um, this microbial composition can change um, throughout life uh, as you age or um, with different lifestyle um, habits or diet and disease. So for example, as you age, um, in, this, in this graph you can see that some of your microbiome changes where there may be increase in, let's say, firmicutes. Or um, in obese individual, individuals, you'll get an increase in firmicutes to proteobacteria ratio. Um, so the changes in these relative amounts of taxa um, at the following level or below, it has been shown that more diversity is, is normally associated with better health. And also, um, a dysbi dysbiosis, which is defined as a microbial imbalance, has been associated with disease, different disease states. Um, for example, uh, such as obesity or malnutrition. So the 16S uh, marker gene um, can be used to determine the composition of any microbial communi community that could be from different sites within the human microbiome, um, different environmental samples, or even um, agricultural samples. So here is a depiction of the um, 16S gene. It's, it's like I said, it's a highly conserved gene um, that's in all bacteria and in, in all archaea. It's approximately 1.5 kb in length and has um, uh, these conserved regions depicted in blue and these variable regions depicted in um, red. Um, so these conserved regions are where um, a primers uh, targeting the 16S region bind to, and the variable regions are um, are sequences that are divergent enough between different species or genus where it allows for classification of a particular um, species or genus. Um, in the in the lower figure is uh, fungal, uh, fungal ribosomal RNA, and in particular the ITS region. Um, so this particular ITS region is also highly variable and can be used for a classification similar to the 16S gene. So next, um, I'll talk about the uh, chi 6 16S ITS panels and how it solves um, uh, general NGS challenges. So when dealing with um, next generation sequencing and uh, 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, there are um, several challenges to se sequencing the 16S ribosomal RNA gene and fungal ITS. So in general, uh, single amplicon sequencing um, causes a, a reduced library complexity, and then this leads to uh, poor qual quality reads, where most of the reads may be thrown out and not informative. Um, the second challenge is uh, the selection of the 16S um, ribosomal RNA gene region that is most appropriate for the study aims. And this could be due to um, your sample type or what you actually want to look for in, within that sample. Um, the third challenge is that high background noise 
in your PCR reagents, either either in the master mix itself or in the water, or is contaminated with microbial DNA. The last challenge is um, complex data analysis uh, that require multiple steps when you use open source tools. So for the first challenge, um, with reduced library complexity, um, one way to uh, solve this challenge is the, is the use of um, phi x in your uh, NGS run. However, um, at times you have to use a high amount of phi x, which leads to um, really uh, wasted read capacity that could be used towards your um, uh, bacterial classification. So one way to get around this is to use phased primers. So what phased primers are, are um, in a 16S primers, that include up to uh, zero to 11 additional bases at their five prime ends. So if you look at this um, top graph, um, so in each of these, each of these is one position along the, uh, let's say, cycle read. Um, if you use uh, phased primers, uh, it allows um, more base diversity and equal uh, nucleotide balance. So that way, in one cycle in your read, it's not just one base that the sequencer is reading, but it's it's a mixed ba a basis um, that this uh, sequencer is reading. So this uh, shift in nucleotide balance by the phase primers um, increases base diversity. And what this leads to is an increase in quality scores, which allows for more sequences to be used in your OTE clustering and classification, instead of wasting um, your sequences on, on phi x sequence. So um, here are uh, fluorescent uh, images um, in comparison between um, a run using unphased primers and phased primers. So in between these two runs, both were targeting the V3, V4 region um, and using the exact same primer and the exact same sample type. Um, in the unphased primers, uh, unphased uh, section, um, the top or the fluorescent, uh, uh, fluorescent images from the um, MySeq instrument. Um, so R1 uh, signifies read one, and cycle one is the very first um, cycle that the uh, sequencer acquires. So here you can see most of the signal is in the C channel. And what this causes is an uneven base distribution um, within your read um, in your primer region and throughout the whole uh, read. And this leads to drop in qu quality scores. So here in this bluish um, line and within the quality distribution is about 5% of your reads um, are of very low qu quality. And then um, in the black and reddish line or 25 and 50% of, of your reads are also of low quality. However, if you look at the phased um, fluorescent images in read one and cycle one, there's a, the, the um, fluorescent images are more even without, within the four channels. So within the ACGT, it's approximately the same um, fluorescent intensity. So if you look at the base distribution in a phased um, in read one, there's a more even base distribution or higher base diversity um, within the primer region and throughout the whole read, um, especially compared to the unfazed uh, run. And then this leads to higher qu quality scores. So if you compare the uh, qual quality distribution in the phase run, um, there's only a small amount of reads that are lower quality 
um, and a majority of them are, are high quality, especially compared to the unfazed ones. So this means basically that more, more of your reads are high quality and will be used for your OT clustering and classification. So the second challenge so the second challenge is um, which region should I sequence? Um, and the answer, it depends on your sample type and what your research question is. So if your research question might be what, you know, what region has the most diversity or if you're um, interested in a particular um, genus or species. Um, that would depend on which region that you uh, sequence. Um, it's known that it's been known that different hypervariable regions have various degrees of classification um, precision, and then this depends on um, what type of sample. Also, um, the primers that are used for uh, amplifying the 16S regions, even though they're technically um, uh, universal, they're not actually universal primers. So these primers may have a bias um, for or against certain taxa. So one example is that um, the B4, B5 primers amplify most uh, archaeal species. Um, however, if you look at other primer sets such as V1, V2, um, they amplify either none or very few archaeal species. So um, they're biased against that particular um, um, tree of life. Um, to, so one way to get around this is to sequence um, um, amplicons that cover the full gene. So what the CASIC 16S ITS screening panel does it covers the entire 16S ribosomal RNA gene by, by splitting up into different amplicons. And also, it, it, it sequences the fungal ITS. So the screening panel contains amplicons that cover V1, V2, V2, V3, V3, V4, V4, V5, V5, V7, V7, V9, and fungal ITS. We also um, offer region panels where you can select one to three regions um, to multiplex um, and sequence. So, as I said, um, there's no one region that is optimal for every study. Um, in fact, th th so this is just a sampling of, of different studies that have been done. Um, even as studies that um, that look at the same sample type do not use the same 16S region. So, for example, if you look at the human um, vagina microbiome, um, the V1, V2 region has been uh, used to sequence, and V3, V4. And if you look at the gut microbiome, um, V4 region has been used. Um, also uh, V5, V6, and V6, V8. So using these uh, different regions in different studies, um, it's difficult to compare, have a comparison between these different studies. So therefore, um, this, uh, Kaizen, uh, Kaizen offers the screening panel, which allows um, sequencing of all these different uh, variable regions um, in one sequencing run and in, in one library prep. So the benefit of using this uh, screening panel is it allows um, a more robust bacterial profiling um, when you compare it to screening only individual variable regions. So in here, the screening panel was used to sequence a uh, a mock community from ATCC. So this mock community sample um, is has known um, bac bacterial uh, species with known um, bacterial um, abundance of each species. 
So after using the screening panel, um, uh, each region was analyzed, and you can see in that. You can see, at least for this one particular species, um, Streptococcus mutans, that V1, V2, V2, V3, V3, V4, and V4, V5 could not classify um, Streptococcus mutans at the species level. However, the primers were able to amplify this particular species, as shown by the observed um, genus level being similar to the expected level. Um, but however, um, V5, V7, and V7, V9 regions were able to uh, classify strep mutans to the species level, um, showing that it's better to use more than one region um, for your uh, microbiome 16S studies. Okay. Um, and then Another way to determine which region is actually the most informative um, for your studies is to um, determine the diversity of each region. So here, um, a sewage sample was, uh, was sequenced with a screening panel, and the uh, one FASTQ file was then um, demultiplexed into the six individual uh, variable regions. And alpha diversity, as measured by total number of OTUs, was measured for each region. So here, for this particular sewage sample, um, V4, V5, and V3, V4 show the highest diversity and, um, and may be used for further studies, especially if you're using sewage environmental samples. So, Another way of trying to identify which region is um, most informative is to look at the classification power of each region. So here, again, um, the classification for each of the variable regions was, was determined for the sewage sample. Um, and the classification power is determined by the fraction of taxa that was that was classified at that particular um, uh, at that particular level of the ta of the taxonomy tree. So, for example, if you look at the uh, family, um, this shows the number of sequences that were classified to the family level, um, and this, uh, similar with the genus, the number of uh, OTUs that were classified at the genus level or the species level. So here it shows that um, V3, V4, and V4, V5 regions um, appear to have the highest uh, taxonomic resolution um, for this particular uh, sewage sample. Um, one thing to note is, um, so in at times, um, some of these databases, the, the 16S sequence may not be complete. And when it's not complete, um, it's the ends that are missing. So um, the lower uh, classification in the V1, V2, and V7, V9 may be an artifact because of the truncated sequences, uh, 16S sequences that occur in those databases. The third challenge is how microbial DNA um, background that may occur. Um, so if you have um, low biomass samples, which is um, samples that have low bacterial content, even trace amounts of uh, bacterial or fungal DNA within your master mix or water um, may bias results. So Kaizen has developed a PCR kit um, to address this concern, and then this PCR kit is a critical component of the um, Chi-Seq 16S ITS um, panels. So to test this uh, um, mass, uh, UCP master mix from Kaizen, um, 
we um, uh, the 16S primers that target um, bacterial DNA and 18S primers that target fungal DNA were used to amplify um, an NTC sample or no template control or basically water and um, also um, two to 200 genome copies of E. coli or three to 300 genome copies of Candida. So both the 16S and ITS uh, 16S and 18S uh, primer sequence uh, primers were able to amplify um, down to two or three genome copies. However, um, no uh, signal can be detected in the NTC showing that um, both the master mix and the UCP water um, are very clean and um, uh, there's no or low background noise um, associated with um, those reagents. So um, during library construction, um, environmental contamination could be introduced. So one way to monitor that is to use the Kaiseq 16S ITS smart control. So what the uh, smart control is, is basis, basically a synthetic DNA um, that contains primer binding sites from, that originate from E. coli. And then um, in between the primer binding sites are, are sequences from Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, these sequences replace the hypervariable 16S ribosomal RNA sequences. Um, these Arabidopsis sequences cannot be classified as bacterial or fungal. So therefore, any sequences that are classified using the smart control is due to environmental contamination um, that was introduced during the operating construction. And then using this um, control, you can monitor both your um, library con uh, construction and also um, mo monitor any environmental uh, contamination that may be introduced. So the workflow for the um, chi seq 16 s ITS panels is um, pretty straightforward. So first, you start with the sample extraction um, using um, kit format um, specific for your sample type. Um, next is to perform a 16S or ITS PCR. If you're um, doing the screening panel, this uh, requires um, to set up three PCR reactions. If you're doing the PCR uh, screening panel, then you will pull those three PCR reactions do two rounds of B cleanup. Um, um, and then set up a sample index PCR. Then after that PCR, do a one round of classic B cleanup, um, followed by library QC, pull the libraries and sequence. Then after you, um, you do the sequence, um, do a data analysis. If, if you do the screening panel, uh, you will have to do uh, amplicon demultiplexing. So one way of doing um, data analysis is using uh, Kaizen's uh, a CLC microbial genomics module. Um, this module allows uh, data to dis uh, disco discovery workflow. It's basically an integrated analytics, um, and it's, uh, all, it's all the an analytics for my microbial genomics and metagenomics. And um, it's very streamlined workflow, um, which allows you to not worry about stringing together um, scripts from open source uh, software, but just allows you to uh, analyze and interpret um, your data. So the workflow for the uh, Kyogen 16S ITS panels is basically first to import the data and um, do a QC of, of the FASTQ files within the microbial genomics module. And then if you're doing the um, screening panel, um, to, do, 
to demultiplex that one fast Q file into six fast Q files for each of the um, 16S re regions. Next, you want to add a database um, for either your 16S um, uh, sequences or your ITS sequences. This is followed by OTU, clust OTU clustering and classification, and then some type of um, diversity analysis. So next, we um, performed an interesting saliva microbiome study. Um, the reason we did this is because um, in the liter literature, um, there's been shown that there's differences in the oral microbiome um, that's associated with diet and different uh, systemic conditions such as obesity. Also, um, saliva is very e easy to access and is a non-invasive sample um, that can be used to study the oral microbiome. So previous um, studies that have um, sequenced the 16S gene from, the, um, from saliva has um, targeted only one region. So by targeting, and normally there are different regions between the different studies. So this um, presents challenges when you want to compare the data across um, different studies. So the approach that we took was that we collected um, saliva um, from um, donors in a blinded manner. Then we used the Kaya Ant Power Fecal Pro Kit um, to extract the bacterial and fungal DNA. Uh, the Kaya 6 uh, screening panel was used to generate libraries and any um, association between the saliva microbiome um, diversity and with BMI or broad food choices um, were studied. So here um, we show the diversity um, in the saliva microbiome. So in this bottom left panel is um, the, the diversity of, of all the different regions. So these, in, in this particular um, sample set, um, v, the V7 and V9 region looks like it has a slightly different um, profile at the genus level and can detect um, genuses that are not detectable in um, the other regions. And also, if you look at the total, um, total named species in the, um, in the region diversity um, graph, again, V7 and V9 appears to have the highest number of, of named species that it can classify. Um, and the right-hand graph shows the um, alpha diversity as measured by total OTUs. And it appears that uh, V4, V9, V4, V5 region, region um, allows the highest diversity um, when compared to the other regions. So it looks like that V4, V5, and V7, V9 may be the most informative regions um, for saliva. So next, we looked at the, um, the, the diversity of um, the diversity in relation to um, BMI. So basically, I'm looking at um, obese individuals compared to overweight and normal weight. Um, so in each region, the obese group had a lower um, diversity as measured by Shannon ent entropy, um, which shows that um, in obese uh, saliva microbiome, there is um, less diverse, it's, it's a less, mi less diverse microbiome um, compared to um, the normal weight group. So next, um, we took we looked at the V4, V5 region um, specifically and looked at the, at the phylum level. So at the phylum level, 
there uh, was an increase in Firmicutes to proteobacteria ratio. Um, and if you look at the differential abundance um, between the two um, groups, there were a number of genuses that were either lower in the obese group, um, for example, the Neisseria um, or Porphyromonas, um, and there were um, some that were increased in the obese group, such as Actinomyces. Next, we looked at the effect of this uh, association of the saliva microbiome on broad food choices, or more specifically, um, an Eastern-based diet compared to a Western-based diet. So um, in this mi middle uh, graph shown the uh, Shannon entropy, um, this is looking at the V7 and V9 region, and with this, um, with this, within this region, um, actually the V7, um, actually the Western-based group has a lower diversity um, compared to the Eastern-based group. And then at the phylum level, again, um, the Western-based uh, diet, um, there was an increase in Firmicutes to proteobacteria ratio. And then if you look at the differential abundance, um, there was a, a significant um, increase in Vianella and uh, Megasphera and Atopium genus in the Western diet. And there was a decrease in, in Haemophilus um, and Capnocytophage in um, uh, the Western diet compared to the Eastern-based diet. So in summary, uh, we use the CHI-Seq 16S ITS panels, um, which examine um, the full uh, 16S ribosomal uh, gene. Um, and we observe differences between um, groups based on BMI or on broad food choices, uh, Western or, or Eastern-based diets. And interestingly, um, the Western-based diet group show similarities to the eastern uh, to the obese BMI group in the uh, saliva microbiome. So thank you for your attention, and um, I will open up to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Matt and Dominic, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar, and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click the Send button. Our speakers will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is going to be, what is the best method to perform sample lysis? Okay, yeah, so uh, this is Dominic, and clearly um, we, we put a lot of effort into making sure that the uh, Cayenne Power Fecal Pro kit is the one that will provide the, the best method um, overall due to the bead lysis. But you have, you have a choice in how you perform the bead lysis, whether you want to do it in um, a high-powered bead beater, in which case you'll be able to get it out more quickly, but you can also do it in something like a vortex adapter, where it may take a little bit more time, um, it may take up to the 10 minutes to get it, but you'll still get as efficient of a, of a bead lysis. Um, so the protocols are written such that you know uh, we will define how it should be done on chiagen instruments. For stuff outside of that, um, it's going to have to be optimized separately. Um, but I think it's quite um, straightforward that using a mechanical lysis seems to be the best method to get unbiased bacterial representation. Now our next question, this one is going to be for you, Matt. Where do the primer sequences come from or how are they designed? Yes, yeah, so um, all the primer sequences originate from base 
This is a publicly available database for um, of oligos that target the um, ribosomal RNA gene. Um, uh, specifically, the V4, V5, and ITS regions of uh, primers um, originate from uh, Earth Microbiome Project, um, which is a well-known primer set. Um, so all these primers are um, uh, publicly available. However, um, some of the primers have been um, modified in order to um, allow multiplexing of, of all the primers within one uh, PCR uh, condition. Now, Dominic, let's go back to you. What do I do if my sample is still inhibitory? Yeah, so um, I, I discussed quite a bit about how the samples can be um, very inhibitory, and in some cases, even despite all of the, the tricks and the techniques that we use to um, get rid of our um, inhibitory substances, it still may be the case that one of a particularly difficult sample causes inhibition later on. Um, in those cases, we recommend um, to actually decrease the sample amount. Um, then you will also end up decreasing the inhibitory amount. For samples like that, what we'll sometimes see is actually you'll get an increase of yield by decreasing the um, input amount. And for 99% of samples, that will um, resolve the issue. I mean, to be fair, 95% of samples won't have any inhibitory um, substances remaining after uh, using the, one of the power line of kits. Um, and of those that may still have some um, inhibitors present, starting with a slightly slower, slower amount of material helps. Um, and then the last line of resort would be to, to dilute your eluate before going into your downstream reactions. That should also improve matters. And it looks like we have time for one more question. So, Matt, this one is for you. Can I use open source software to analyze the FASTQ file? Yes, you can use um, open source software um, such as Chime or Mother. Um, however, for the uh, screening panel, since it contains uh, sequences for all six um, uh, variable regions, um, we do have a demultiplexer um, that is uh, freely, freely available um, and can be downloaded from GitHub. So um, we will supply this link um, within uh, GeneGlobe um, on, on Kaizen's website and in the handbook. Thank you. I would like to once again thank Matt and Dominic for their presentation. I would also like to thank Labyrinth for, make, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinth letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.